for that. Yo. Man, um, I don't know about you guys, but uh, thank you for the hand claps because I am so excited about what God is doing through Lake Forest. If you do not know me, my name is Terrell Holly, and, and I am, in fact, uh, the lead pastor of Lake Forest University uh, City, which we are calling U City. All right. And so um, I'm just so honored to be a part of this Lake Forest Center. Family And if you are watching online, a special welcome and special thanks to you if you are on the couch, on the beach, I'm jealous. If you are um, on your phone watching, hey, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Like I said, um, I am Terrell Huntley and I am 34 years old. Um, I feel like that's old because my body is deteriorating. Um, I have like this crick uh, on this side of my neck that won't go away. So if you know any home remedies, you know, just uh, just tell me after service. Shoot me an email. Um, I love music, as you may know, um, and I just love uh, people. And so that's a little about myself. I also have a four year old son uh, named Roman. If you could see here, he is. Here's my beautiful family. Um, man, I don't hear any odds. Oh, that's, that's a little one. That was a little one. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. No, uh, this is my, my four-year-old son. He is one of the sweetest boys you will ever meet, but he's also a big inconvenience. I'm, let's, I mean, let's be honest, all right? Kids, or, if you have kids, uh, you love your kids, but they are a inconvenience most of the time. And, that's, and you can have both. That's fine. And this is my wife, Kimmy. Uh, she is a, a mental health uh, therapist, and I am her big inconvenience. Um, yeah. Uh, she uh, loves people, a great mother. Uh, she is also a, a self-care advocate, right? And, and that's where a lot of people know her for her push for taking care of yourself, loving yourself well so that you can love others well. And because of this, and she does this on on social media and she speaks at conferences and all of that stuff, so uh, she may be labeled, labeled an influencer. And I would label her personally as an influence because I see the influence that she has on people. And so the truth is, is that she is an influencer. And so are you. See, um, there are many influencers in this world, and you you may know these people here. If you would throw them on the screen, Zach King, Liza Koshy, Will Smith, my man. Um, uh, Brene Brown, genius, Rachel Hollis, uh, y'all may know who she is. These are influencers, and influencers are someone who has established credibility in a specific area and has access to an important audience and can persuade others to act based on their recommendations or actions. Now, we, based off of this Definition, we are constantly influencing others. If you are a mom, you are an influencer. Dad, CEO, friend, mentor, coach, you are an influencer. No one can run from this. If you are on social media, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you are an influencer. People are reading your posts, and they are being influenced by you. So, it is maybe not something that you want, but it's something that you have. And your influence is your responsibility, whether you want it or not. It is your responsibility. Just like the president of the United States at any time, we can feel their influence. We can feel the presence. They influence 
the country in a certain way, good or bad. So your influence is your responsibility. So that also means that we are constantly being influenced. And so with this responsibility, a lot of influencers ask, who am I influencing? But I think the more important question is, is who is influencing you? Now, let's look at one of the greatest influencers in the Old Testament, perhaps the entire Bible. Her name is Deborah. All right. How many of you, by the raising of your hand, know who Deborah is? Right. And this is why we are talking about her this morning. Now, to make it clear, one of the greatest influencers of the Bible is a woman. Just to make it clear, abundantly clear, one of the greatest influences of the Bible is a woman. And she's a whole leader out here of the Israelites. Uh, she's also known for her wisdom and her courage. And she is the only woman in the Old Testament known for her own faith apart from any man. Man, you have to realize how special this woman is. As a prophet, because she was a prophet, uh, Deborah heard God's voice and shared God's words with others. This is very important. As a prophet, Deborah heard God's voice and shared God's words with others. Now, she had that ability, but guess what? Because of the Holy Spirit, we do too. Thank you. I, th I thought that was good news. Huh? As a priestess, guess what? As a priestess, she led worship services like this, and she also preached. And as a judge, Deborah was one of the rulers of the Hebrews. And the role of a judge originated back when Moses appointed helpers to assist him in resolving arguments among the people. She helped judge situations. Now, we are going through the entire Bible this year called The Whole Story. And Deborah is found in the book of Judges. So we are landing on justice Judges focusing specifically on chapters four and five. Now, Judges was a messy, messy book, man. If you love your dirty reality show, The Housewives of Everything, read Judges. <laughs> they were a messy, messy people. And this is why they were messy. Because they didn't want to be influenced, they wanted to be the influencer. And this got them into a lot of trouble. Now, there's one verse that explains the whole book of Judges. Now, we are reading the whole Bible, so this is not an excuse not to read Judges. But if you don't want to, all you got to do is read this verse and you're good. This explains the whole book. Now, here we go. And this verse is, again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. That's it. That's the whole book. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord again and again. See, the Israelites were a chosen people handpicked by God, and so they could be a canvas for God to paint his character and his goodness to be displayed to the world. He wanted to use these people to show history and show the world who he was, but they did not want him. The Israelites, uh, uh, it's like my four-year-old son and maybe a kid of yours. The Israelites, again, did evil in the sight of God. I would tell Roman to not do something. He would do it. He would do evil. 
in my sight. Now, I'm not the Lord. I mean, God is up here. I'm way down here. But I am his father. I am his guardian. Roman would continually do evil in my sight. And I tell him, Roman, stop doing evil in my sight. He did. And then he just looks at me like I'm stupid because he doesn't understand what that is. But I'm like, hey, Roman, stop doing that. And Roman would do it. And he would do something bad while I'm watching him. And then I would have to do something I don't want to do. I would have to put him in time out. And then he would ask me, Dad, can I come out of time out? And I would say, okay, yes. I would have mercy on him and say yes. And then guess what do you do? Find something else. Do something bad while I'm watching them. Then I would have to put them in time out. Then he would do it again and again and again. This is what the people of Israelites were doing. But there is good news, though. And this is up here. Uh, Let's see if uh, we can spot it. The good news is in the eyes of the Lord. That means God was always watching. God was always paying attention, though. Even though they did evil in the sight, God would still look. And it wasn't a, a, a cold looking. It wasn't a cold stare. You know, just one of these. Uh, does it make you feel uncomfortable? It would me, right? It, it wasn't this cold stare. It was a hopeful, passionate overlooking. It, it, it was a please get it right, like my son, Roman, please get it right this time. That's, that is what in the eyes of the Lord means. It's this hopeful, passionate overlooking. It's almost as if you are watching your favorite football team or basketball team, or if you are a student, you are in the student section, and you are watching the game, but you're not just staring at the TV or staring at the players play. You are in the game. You are hopeful. You are rooting for them. You are upset when they make a mistake. You are in the game with them, and if they lose, guess what? You are upset, but then you show back up. And if they lose again, guess what? You are upset, but you show back up. This is what it means to be in the eyes of the Lord. It is a he is engaged. He is rooting for you. God is rooting for you. And he will never leave you. That is the good news. So, because God's people chose to do evil in the sight, there were consequences. And the consequences were that they were sold into captivity. Different times, numerous times, that is what their time out was, that they were sold into captivity. They were oppressed. They were handed over so that other people can rule them. God put them in time out. And they would cry out to God like my son Roman would if he's in time out and say, please save me, take me out of time out. And I would hear him. And I would come to his rescue and say, enough, come. And this happened several times, but, but there was a time where the people of Israel did this, and God said, I will save you, but I will send a force of nature, and that person is Deborah. So now we can hop into it. Now we can hop into it. So we are in the book of Judges, chapter 4, and we are going to start at verse 4. Again, remember Deborah was one of the greatest influences in the Old Testament, and this is why. This, this story of this woman doing an incredible thing. So pay attention. This is a real story. 
This is not anything made up. This is not a fable. This was real. Verse 4, it says this. Now Deborah, a prophet, the wife of Libidoth, was leading Israel at the time. So she held court under the palm of Deborah, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. She was leading Israel, all of Israel, she was leading them, a woman. And one day, she sent for Barak. Now, Barak was the military commander. And I all the time want to say Barack Obama, but it's Barak. And verse 6 says, the Lord, the God of Israel commands you. This is what she tells Barak. The the God of Israel commands you, go take with you 10,000 men and lead them up to Mount Tabor. And I will lead Sisera, the commander of King Jabber's, Jabin's army. He was the oppressor. And she said, I will lead Sisera, the commander of King Jabin's army, and give him into your hands. Verse 8, Barrett said to her, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Barrett, you wimp. He said, hey, I will go if you go. But if you don't go, I'm staying put. And verse 9, you know, graceful Deborah with all her kindness And all her courage. And she says, of course I will go with you, brother. But because of this attitude that you have, because you are scared, because of your disposition, the honor would not be yours, for the Lord would deliver Sisera into the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak and his 10,000 men, and they went to fight in Kadesh. Well, someone told Sisera that Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor. So Sisera went with 900 chariots ready to fight. Now that 900 chariots means something. That means that they were very technologically advanced. Not a lot of people had 900 iron chariots. Verse 14, then Deborah said to Barak, go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? That was confident. So Barak went down Mount Tabor with 10,000 men, and Barak advanced, and he fought, and the Lord gave Sisera into his hands. And all of Sisera's troops, the oppressor, was killed. Not a man was left. But Sisera fled. He ran. He just left all his men hanging and he ran and he ran into this woman's house. Oh, no, men. This will teach you right here. Do not run into another woman's house. He runs into this woman named J.L.'s house and he felt comfortable doing so because she was an ally to King Jabin. And he ran in (laughs) exhausted and tired and, and he told her that he was thirsty. And, and she, and he specifically asked for some water. And she was like, you know what? You're tired. You have been fighting all day. I have something better for you. Here's some milk. Now, we all know what milk does to us. Well, okay, I guess me. It puts me to sleep like a baby. And so she gives him milk. She tells him to lay down, get some rest. She gets a warm blanket and she says, go to sleep, go to sleep. And as he's going to sleep, he says, if anybody shows up looking for me, tell them that I am not here. And she was like, bet. If anybody shows up, I will tell them that you're not here. And so Sisera falls asleep. And she <laughs> reaches in her, her uh, cabinet 
And, you know, and she has her dishes um, and her cups, and she has, I don't know, just a random sharp peg um, <laughs> and a hammer. She reaches up in her cabinet, and, uh, and she looks at him, and she's like, go to sleep, go to sleep. And she takes this sharp peg, and she puts it up to his temple, and she reaches her hand as far back as she could, and she wham! Stabs him in the temple, and he dies instantly. Dies instantly. Then comes Barak, looking for Sisera. He's running up, hey, uh, you seen Sisera? Because we got to fight, I got to kill him. And J.L. says, ha, I beat you to it. I got him. Walk in here, look. And Barrett walks in and sees Sisera dead on her little comfortable couch. Verse 33 says, on that day, God defeated Jabin King of Canaan before the Israelites. And the Israelites pressed harder and harder against Jabin King of Canaan until they destroyed him. See, I bet you thought Deborah would be the woman that gets the credit for winning this war. But no, it was a person who came out of left field. JL. And that reminds me of how uh, people thought Jesus would come. Just, just with the army strong, ready to fight because he was the savior, but he snuck attacked him and came in another way, in a way that was unexpected. And so, what do you do when you drive a state through someone's head? What do you do? You write a beautiful song. That's what they did. Chapter 5, they wrote this beautiful song. Deborah and Barrett wrote this beautiful song. Read it. It's such a beautiful passage, but I love how it ended. It, Judges 5, verse 31, and it says, May all your enemies die like this, Lord. Wow, that's a beautiful line. But may all those who love you be as strong as the rising sun. Now, Deborah loved God and rose in victory as did everyone else with her. Because Deborah was with God, a whole nation profited. See, when you choose to be influenced by God, you not only experience his goodness, but the people around you connected to you do too. Your friends, your family. Some of you may be wondering why your family is chaotic right now. It may be because you're not being influenced by God. You're not spending time with God. I don't know about you, Woman or not, but I'm inspired by Deborah. I'm inspired. Because if we look at other prophets, prophets would do this thing where they would go away, spend time with God, and come back. Go away, spend time with God, and come back. Go away, spend time with God, and come back. Moses did this. Jesus did this. Deborah did this. And I believe that any time a person spends time with God, they are different. When I spend time with God in the morning, I'm different. I can tell the days I don't spend time with God and the days I do spend time with God. Do you allow yourself to be influenced by God? Well, God influenced Deborah. And how do we know this? Because of her disposition. 
her swag, her poise, her, her character, how she carried herself. We know that God influenced Deborah. You know that person who just has a great calming disposition. And this is what a disposition is. It's a, personal, a person's natural qualities of mind and character, the way they carry themselves. And your disposition is your influence. There's, there is a person that you know that you just love being around because their disposition and it influences you. Deborah's disposition was peaceful. And how do we know this? Because Judges 4, chapter 5 says, chapter 5 says, she held court under the palm of Deborah, and the Israelites went up to her to have their disputes decided. See, she was peaceful because she was the peacekeeper. Deborah was peaceful because she was the peacekeeper. Now, sometimes she had to be disrupted, disrupting for ultimate peace, but she was the peacekeeper. Does your disposition show that you are a person of peace? Also, her disposition was of that of confidence. How do we know this? She was very confident. Not in who she was, but who God was. See, Judges 4, verse 6 says this. The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, take 10,000 men. So you have to be confident to say the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. What if you walked up to a person that says God commands you? I mean, that takes confidence. You are speaking for God. But then it, and she takes it a step even further. It says, get 10,000 men. Now, she could be leading these men to their death. You have to be confident in who God is to put families at risk. Again, Judges 4 and 14. This is another example. It says, go. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. And she, like, asked him this, this question that maybe made him feel stupid. You know, didn't I tell you that the Lord was going to go in front of you ahead? I can imagine her saying that with such confidence. Didn't I tell you that the Lord has gone ahead of you? And third, Deborah was like God. Verse 8, if you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. And see, Deborah had something Barrett was confident in. Deborah had something that, that Barrett was not willing to leave behind. And that was God. So, what is your disposition today? Are you anxious? Are you scared? Are you angry? Are you hurt? Has someone caused you to be fearful? Has someone caused you to be anxious? What is your disposition? Can you stand tall and be confident in who God is? See, like Deborah... Get this, what's in you determines your disposition. What's in you determines your disposition. And your disposition impacts how you influence. What's in you determines your disposition. And your disposition impacts how you influence. God in you determines your disposition. Which determines your influence, how you influence. Hey, it's the cheat code. God's influence on you determines your influence on others. How many of you want to be influenced by God? I do. 
And you can raise your hand. That's fine. I want to be influenced by God. But guess what? Most of the time, I don't want to. I want to be the influencer. Maybe like you. You want to be influenced by God. You have the heart to, but you want to be the influencer. You don't feel like spending time with God. You much too busy to spend time with God, to be to sit and be influenced by God. See, when I was uh, a few years ago, I was uh, I felt God was calling me to plant a church. And I told God, absolutely not. Are you crazy? I'm sorry. I didn't call God crazy. I'm, I may have called God crazy. I don't know. But absolutely not. No, there are a lot of churches around here. No. And, and, and I, I ran and I fought him on it. But then COVID happened. Years later, COVID happened and God set me down. And he said, hey, you are going to plant. And I finally accepted it. I said, okay, I'm planting. But God, if I plant, I'm going to do this my way and my part of the city, this, the place in the city where I want to. And this will be the goal. This will be the mission. This will be the vibe. This will be how the church will form. And God said, absolutely not. <laughs> no, God, but you hear me telling you this is what I'm going to do. I put my foot down and he tripped me. <laughs> See, I wanted to be the influencer instead of being influenced by God with the church plan. We have this thing at U City. It's we say Jesus over preference. That's our guiding to Jesus over preference. But in this case, I wanted my preference over Jesus. But when he forced me to spend time with him, my preference shrunk. And all I wanted was Jesus. Which led me to this moment right here. God said, like, listen to me, Sam, because I have something better for you. I have the, the Lake Forest family. Okay, five woos. Okay, okay, all right. Yes, yes. I just got so hyped, I lost where I was. Is there a place in your life where God needs to influence? Is there a place in your life where God needs to influence? God is who we should be continually influenced by, and the only way we can do that is by spending time with him. See, Deborah was one of the greatest influencers then, but we have a greater influence now. And his name is Jesus, who came and showed us how to live a perfect life that he knew that we could not live. So he traded our filth, our mistakes, flaws for his righteousness, for his goodness, for his right standing. And I don't know about you, that's the person that I want to be influenced by. And so here's our shared challenge. I do this thing called shared challenges. It's shared because we all should do it, and the challenge because it may be something that's a little hard, maybe a little challenging. And this is our shared challenge. Go away. Spend time with God for 15 minutes a day this week and come back. It may seem simple, but I have an issue doing this. And you might too. But for a week, for seven days, go away. Go away means in solitude. Now, solitude can look like a walk. It, it can look like journaling. It, it can look like just sitting there. But in solitude. And the reason we should do this in solitude because 
Solitude quiets all of the other influences in your life. This is our shared challenge. Go away. Spend time with God for at least 15 minutes a day this week. And come back. And I want you to write down, take note of how God influences you. And in return, how you influence others. How you parent, how you deal with your spouse, how you deal with your partner, how you lead your small group, how you coach, how you interact with people. Write down the differences. And if we all did this week by week, right, think about how it would shape our communities if we all spent 15 minutes with God and coming back. Think about the impact we would have on our schools and and on our families. Man, the world is broken. Systems are broken. But think about this. If we spend time with God, if everybody did this, how would it impact your community. God's influence on you determines how you influence others. And you have influence whether you want it or not. And it is your responsibility to steward that influence well. Ultimately, I want people to see Jesus in me. And that's the influence that I want to have on others. Sharing people with Jesus when they are with me is so contagious so contagious. A lot of times we just just walk casually through life going about our day-to-day rituals and routine and not knowing the effect of how God's influence would have on you and the people that you influence. My challenge is seek after that influence this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for uh, this family. Thank you for what you are doing in these hearts. And God, this week, like Deborah, we want to be influenced by you. We want to be loved by you. We want to feel your love. We want to feel your peace, God. And this comes with spending time with you. So Holy Spirit, Empower us to spend time with you. Because a lot of times we cannot do this on our own. Holy Spirit, guide us in this. I thank you for what Jesus did on the cross. By not just dying for me, but dying as me. It should have been me but you took my place and I am so grateful. And as we sing, God, remind us of how much we need you and how much you love us. And in return, we can love you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.